not it doesn't operate in a linear fashion. It operates in a cyclical fashion. And you know, that's one of the things that I have to try to break people's mindset of this whole linear thinking and realize that, you know, this we're just going through another cycle. That's I think part of probably a larger cycle, which may be even part of a larger cycle. Adapt 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers change in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift affecting global crop output but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time cold weather crop losses our sun is going through a 400 year cycle which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow it's not co2 it's not you it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. And I do welcome you this morning. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are on this planet. So many events happening through the headlines related to economics, population migration, the intensification of the grand solar minimum. Mainstream media coming full out, talking about ice ages, cycles in our sun. Yet the fourth national climate assessment mentions not even a peep about how that yellow thing off to the left, that sun, a million times larger than our Earth, has any effect on our weather whatsoever. So the opposition of message is meant to confuse. So today I have with me James White, founder and editor of Northwest Liberty News. He moved to Montana almost seven years ago. His website, NorthwestLibertyNews.com, and the YouTube channel, Northwest Liberty News, focuses the attention on numerous cases of government overreach, what would be considered tyranny, really, and the illegal seizures of land from law-abiding citizens for corporate interests. You know, James and I had done this same radio program a year ago. He used to be the host of this show right here. He took a break. I took over. Since that time, it's been almost nearly an entire year since we've had this program together. It's good to have him back on. What's most interesting is the fires in California, one year ago, we talked about the exact same thing, almost word for word about strange melting of rocks and strange melting of metals yet trees right next to the fires where metal melted hubs of tires of cars melted into just liquid trees literally two feet from that were not even scarred we had the same exact conversation it's almost like copy paste and it's so ridiculous that we're having the same conversation grand solar minimums intensified tremendously since that point since we first had our roundabout when we did the show with Kay Renee as well. So James, welcome back. We have a lot to talk about today. And I I saw on your website there that you had quite a few articles referencing climate change, the grand solar minimum, and how the governments are reacting uh, with sort of a police state stance to get everybody corralled and ready for this massive event of political upheaval, social stability upheaval, and then the reset for our societies. So here we go. It's going to be a great show for any of you trying to connect Multiple points across the grand solar minimum conversation. Well, David, first of all, I just want to uh, thank you very much for having me on the program. Indeed, it has been quite a while since we have broadcast together. It really is good to uh, be back on air with you. And I have to say that I'm most impressed by the opening that you have here for the broadcast. The first time I've heard that, you know, all the times I did the Revolution Radio, I, uh, Jason and I, I'm not sure if you ever been on. I think, as a matter of fact, Jason Van Tatenhove and I hosted the Liberty Brothers. We may have had you on the broadcast, David, if I remember. It's good to be back together. And, uh, you know, regardless of whatever program we're on or what we're doing or whatever website we're we're writing for, we just have to continue to to be in the fight. As I stated on a video I did a couple of days ago, I forget, I think it was an interview, we're going to have to really take our country back 
because they're not going to give it to us. They are going to continue to ramp up the tyranny, the control until we say no. And, you know, we really do have the power, but we just can't come together long enough, David, it seems to use it. And this episode is brought to you by TrueLeafMarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds since 1974. Full range of garden seeds, microgreen seeds, sprouting seeds, wheatgrass, grain seeds, flower seeds, herb seeds, and ground cover crop. I encourage you to take a look at the website, trueleafmarket.com, and they even have free starter guides there for you to learn how to grow sprouts, microgreens, herbs, and wheatgrass. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. You know, this division that you talked about, you really see how they've ramped up since, especially since Trump won the election. They've really, really ramped up the whole division narrative. I mean, they've turned the, they've turned the volume up to 10, and uh, you see it played out day by day. Yeah, and the closer we get to these food shortages, you know, and you got to tie everything back into it, because I see, all right, that's the means to the end, but the end is completely reset button for our society based on solar cycles and we can track these through history you know maunder minimum sporer minimum wolf minimum ort minimum and if you're kind of new to the show and you don't understand what a grand solar minimum is it's a repeating cycle in our sun that comes by about once every 407 410 years and it's like clockwork the sun in high activity state like the let's say a thousand years ago when they were had they were growing vineyards in England and they also were growing larger wheat fields up in Norway, etc. Iceland as well was farming wheat, if you can believe that. Warmer climate led to an abundance, an expansion. Colder climates, all they do is reduce food production and we go into dark ages. There's a lot of effects with the sun energetically. Now, does that trigger you know, mental or physical or spiritual changes in us just being energetic changes, pushing through the whole, I guess, vibration frequency. But you got to keep this in mind. All these changes that are coming, the elites, the powers that be, these leaders of nations, the UN, all IPCC, they're all very aware that this, what is here right now, it is not coming any longer. It is on our doorstep. It's intensifying. It's going to lead to a point in the very near future, I'm literally talking about by 2023 or 2024, there just won't be enough food on this planet, and what you do buy will be double, triple, quadruple the prices you're paying now. Society is going to reset itself along economic lines. There's going to be so many things that just rip apart in terms of social services, the way the government's structured at the moment. They're going to try to control it the best they can. And if you think we're going to sit here and sing Kumbaya moving through this thing, you are sorely mistaken. This is really going to reduce the global population by billions, with a plural S on that. And the police state, the way it's been unfurled since 9-11, I do believe that that was kind of the mark in time. Hey, we got like 20 years left. All these things have been set up. You know, you can't just, you know, set up a police state in a matter of two years. It needs to be slowly put into place. Well, what's the end goal for that? You know, James, you talk a lot about end goals, what the tyranny is, what's happening. We need to take it back. Yeah, we do. And also, we need to also make sure that we can control the food at the same time instead of hoarding going on by by certain factions within government or police or army or military, whatever it might be. And then distributed to the masses or the people who didn't prepare for this event. You know, these are the types of things that we need to, as a collective human consciousness and a bonded together citizenry, start to take back the control of, you know, where our resources come from, how our food's distributed, where our security is coming from, the medicines we get, the supply chains that are running or not running. And we just need to take it all back under control and not give our sovereignty away to so much and depend on others to take care of us. I can't agree with you more. Sadly, right now, before we can actually get to that point, we're going to have to come together much more than we are now. Because with the polarizing world that we live in these days, uh, David, just by the fact that I identify myself as a conservative, I mean, that's, that's just, I identify myself as a conservative, you know, immediately 
no matter there's certain population on the left and a large, sadly, a large amount of them that immediately discount and dismiss anything that I have to say or consider me a fool or whatever other word you want to use. There's real no real dialogue being able to be really undertaken between the left and the right currently. And I think we need to get, before we can get to where you're talking about, something needs to happen, some sort of a catastrophe, which I hope and pray that's not what it is, or there needs to be some other way for us to come together. As I stated a couple of days ago, you know, the answer doesn't lie on the far left or the far right. The answer lies somewhere in the middle. If we're going to move together through this grand solar minimum, because it's going to be some hard times, as you stated, I think right now it would be very difficult to do that with the current state of how things are in America. And I know this is going to be a worldwide event. I can't really do much about anything more right now than really locally. I live in a pretty good place for that, but uh, it's going to be cold. But anyway, nationwide, David, we're really, really fractured here. I don't know if that's by design or if they if they want us fractured when this comes comes about. You know, I can't pretend to know the entire plan, I, you know, because I don't know if anybody does, you know, at our level. They know, you're correct, they know, and you're, they're starting to leak it out now in the mainstream media even more and more about the uh, about the temperatures, about the cold temperatures on the way. As I told you, we talked here before the broadcast, I saw one headline that said, coming up in a few months, the 350-year ice age will be upon us. Uh, as I say to you, I think what they meant was they got – they get confused with, you know, the cycle, and it's more closer to 400 years, but maybe that's what they meant. Because if they're trying to, to I think it's nothing but fear tactics if you're trying to convince people that the Ice Age, mini Ice Age, or whatever you like to call it, is going to last 350 years, well, I think that's just fake news. Yeah, and again, if you're using the words Ice Age in 350 years, you clearly have no idea what you're talking about because Ice Ages generally last uh, 85 to 90,000 years. You know, this planet where we are right now, this interstadial or what they call interglacial, you can interchange those terms. This is the warm time between Ice Ages, and it happens for 10,000 years on average every 100,000 years. So when they're starting to say 350-year Ice Age, well, my personal opinion is, as now they're trying to divide us even further when we try to come together to talk about these very same issues of the grand solar minimum, the mini ice age, well, now they're going to try to get people fighting going, oh, you're one of those ice age believers. You believe there's a whole ice age coming? Oh, my gosh, you can't believe that's two miles thick of ice under Chicago and New York. You're going to believe there's an ice age coming? And I think it's where they're trying to take us again to divide us even further because when this debate, it's already started. Valentina Zarkova, you know, came out at the global warming policy forum and statistically said the years 2028 through 2032 there will not be very much food on this planet grown at all and when i interpreted the percentages to be was less than 20 percent of our current production will be available during that time and it might even be less so she was talking about global food shortages by 2028 and that governments need to get on a manhattan style project at the moment like yesterday is already too late that they need to get together far beyond any kind of cooperation that we've had so far in any type of international forum, but we're the first time truly that the global community will come together to solve a problem, but that it's already almost too late. And she was stating that the governments need to start stockpiling food right now to get through these four to six years of non-growing that's going to happen, 2025 through 2033, somewhere around there. Uh, the availability of it won't be available, period. You know, I talked to a few economists and uh, some some traders and my broker after I saw her report. And and the, the same conclusion came. The people with money were saying, oh, if that's going to be the case and there'll be a very, you know, 80 percent reduction and only 20 percent availability by 2028. We're like, oh, yeah, 2023, 2024, you're going to be looking at triple prices in food. And even if you have the money, you won't be able to get it. So even though they're talking about global cooling in the news they're doing it in such a way that's going to divide us even further to the, I believe in global, oh, I believe there's an ice age, oh, you guys are insane, because most people are so indoctrinated with the IPCC CO2. I think the reality is going to shatter once they learn that CO2 is not the driver and the, the mechanism for any type of changes on our planet. If they are, they're very minimal, I would say less than 5%. But then there's going to be a whole other level waiting for them right there on the you know the next layer down and the layer cake is 
Ice Age, Mini Ice Age, Grand Solar Minimum, Full Blown Ice Age. And people are going to get confused right in there. So again, it's going to have the same, like you said, designed effect. And I will say it again, designed lexicon to confuse, to split, to divide, to argue amongst peers. Guaranteed. That's all it's about. Well, you know, David, I'd like to see some of these um, these tech billionaires. There's a lot of wealth in this country, as you well know, in this world. You know, I don't really pretend to know, to have all the answers, but I think one possible solution, of course, is indoor growing. I think of all the grand solar minimums that we know of that in recorded history, I would suggest to you that during this grand solar minimum, we may be more technologically advanced as a society than perhaps ever before. Now, when I say our known society, could you argue that there was technologies and stuff back in ancient times that was lost? And sure, we can have that debate. And yes, there was a time in history when it seemed that people had a lot more knowledge than they do now, like I said, without going down that rabbit hole. But um, my point being is uh, the technology should be available, I would think, for us to be able to move the growing indoors. I mean, especially with the lighting systems and the hydroponic systems that they have these days. Now, I don't know at the size of something a facility would have to be. I imagine it have to be enormous and there have to be a lot of them. But even if we went that route, something would have to be getting started pretty quickly. Uh, they'd have to at least, because things like that, it'd be cost a lot of money. And things that cost a lot of money usually take a lot of time. Um, so I, I don't know, David, if that's something that, you know, you certainly have your finger on the pulse of this uh, issue way more than me. I'm certainly more of a generalist. I cover a wide variety of topics. And I know you do as well, but you certainly are the expert when it comes to this particular topic. Do you know of, is there anybody out there going that route as far as looking at large indoor growing facilities to be able to to help absorb some of the loss that we're going to have, you know, outdoors? Specifically in a, in a test case, in a working model of something that's been scaled out to the scale that you're talking about, not out in the public arena. But there are gargantuan changes like Brad over at Hidden Harvest he has an all-in-one LED spectrum grow light. So that's an advance in itself versus just a specific blue or red wavelengths. It's just a single unit, and all the wavelengths are encompassed within that single grow light. So you can hit any types of vegetables, herbs, spices, crops that you would want to. But in terms of scaling it out, the only way I could see that would be feasible is using defunct shopping malls using disused mine shafts that we used to mine coal or other minerals from that are underground. This would be a great way to protect from hail damage as well. But I don't see it being scaled at the moment to the point where it can actually be considered a viable food growing option for what we're getting from Mother Nature in the outdoor environment. The only way I can see something would be if you go into Almeria down in Spain, the way they put out you know, hundreds of kilometers of greenhouses down there. But aside from that actual real usage case, but again, that's drawing on just sun from our from our, our natural environment. It's not an actual LED powered equivalent light source for plants to grow. And then you need the, you know, the whole mechanisms for watering. You got to have uh, ventilation in there. What happens if some mold gets in and starts killing off a a batch inside, a, uh, let's say, a strip mall somewhere that they, you know, million square feet and you got it on, then suddenly some virus or some kind of mold fungus sweeps through the entire grow zone. What's going to happen inside? You're going to have to remove everything out, sterilize everything and put it all back in and start from scratch again. I don't know. These are a lot of things and issues that we need to c overcome. But you got to think about the black budget. You know, they're like 21 trillion just went disappearing. Like, where'd that go to? I mean, with that kind of vast money, you talk about big money for big projects. Yeah, if I had that much money, I'm sure I would have something up and running underground by now, too. Not available for you, the public or the normal populace, but for the people I wanted to uh, continue to have food supply for, for sure. And since I have been talking about our need moving forward in this new society that we're entering as our global grain production starts to be reduced in yield, 
your food prices are going to skyrocket. And I mean skyrocket, not just doubling or tripling, something like five or ten times higher by 2020 at the very least. TrueLeafMarket.com. I really want to talk about growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward. They've been around since 1974. Heirloom and organic seeds. You know, since I've started talking about them in my videos, I have a lot of people write and say that they've previously ordered, that they know the owner, having great results, good customer service. They quite enjoyed the seed quality as well. There's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. And we know the benefits of microgreens. All you have to do is use a search engine and look up vitamin, mineral, nutrient content of microgreens. You'll be shocked. Also, sprouts. We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. And not only that, they have wheatgrass and grain seeds. So what I'm talking about grain growing regions going offline, we just need to look back in history and see where across the planet there was difficulty growing grains when this grand solar minimum intensified and the jet stream started wandering just like they're doing today due to a decreased magnetosphere that does not hold our jet streams locked in their traditional flows. Grains are one thing, herb seeds are another, cover crops, something different, but whatever you do, organic seeds are going to be a necessity because you can save those seeds and then grow them the next season, which you unequivocally cannot do with GMO. TrueLeaveMarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. You think continuity of government installations, especially in like Cheyenne, that they don't have food grow facilities inside with them there? Of course they do. Of course they do. Sure. But if they were cut off for six months or a year, of course they're going to continue to grow their own food in continuity of government. James, please continue. I used to be uh, listening to a radio program that was sponsored by a food company. And they'd have the owner of the food company on there periodically to talk about food and that type of thing. And they said that the government came in on a couple of occasions and completely bought them out of all of their food, like their entire warehouse. They came in and bought them out and they had to, of course, restock again. And a couple of years later, they came in and bought them all out again. So they have the government at one point. Now, I don't know if they're still doing that. I don't have that particular radio broadcast and that relationship is not there anymore. So I haven't heard that guy on the radio any longer. So I can't confirm if that's happening still. However, I do know at one point it was, and uh, they were the biggest buyer of storable foods, the biggest customer that this person had for a period of time there. So I think you're you're onto something, and uh, that stuff is not going to be distributed. That food's not going to be distributed to Dave and Jim. Uh, it's going to be distributed, I believe, like as you stated, underground. And I really would like to know, uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to know. But one of the things for sure I'd like to know is I would like to know just how many underground bases or just how much development have they really utilized in an underground environment. I really like to know that. I know there's a lot of it. There's been rumors that under Denver Airport, there's a large underground network there. I don't certainly don't have any proof or confirmation of this, but none of it would surprise me, of course. They know something's going on, David, and, you know, I haven't done as much deep research as you have on the last and the modern minimum, but I do know enough to know that there is a large movement of people away from, you know, where I'm here in Montana. And I know above the 45th parallel, no crops will grow. Now, I don't know if that creeps down below the 45th parallel, but I know that the entire state of Montana, as a matter of fact, I mean, the entire state, the border of southern Montana is just about right at the 45th parallel. So the whole entire state of Montana is above the 45th parallel. So there'll be no crops, historically speaking, David, there'll be no crops growing at all in Montana for I don't know how many many years, but it'll be long enough to where it will 
certainly thin out the population. Uh, and I'm not sure if where I'm sitting here right now in this studio, if this place will even be inhabited with enough people even to live here. Do you think that's a hyperbole by me to say that, David? Or do you think that what I just stated is, is, is possible? I've heard it is possible from, who was it? Uh, who's uh, John? Um, oh, John tra- Casey. Yeah, John Casey. As a matter of fact, I like to know how John's doing. I know he had a, I know he had a stroke, and I, man, I felt so bad about that. I think I sent him an email, but I, I know I'd like to get before we get done with the show. I'd like to find out how he's doing. But yeah, um, this area up here, if I remember correctly, may not be able to be inhabitable. Or he said, if you do live there, it'll be so expensive that you probably won't want to. Um, what do you think about here in Montana? Do we have a chance? Well, it depends if you're going to be growing in greenhouses or whatnot. You know, if you imagine if it becomes the number one destination for growing in greenhouse agriculture to supply that part of the country where food's just not growing naturally. You know, there's all of these opportunities. You know, the things we talk about today, those of you listening out there, James and I talking about this, it sounds so doom and gloomy, but at the same time, on the flip side of it, the opportunity that you're looking at in front of you is the biggest opportunity in human history. I mean, even just what we're talking about here, the refurbing of buildings into indoor growth centers, the opportunity to, you know, outfit or build out large greenhouse infrastructure in areas that aren't going to be able to grow naturally. The periphery seasons are going to get too short to grow. I mean, everywhere you look, there's an opportunity billions of people are going to try to be migrating around the planet at the same time. My personal feeling is, and I've been told absolutely to 100% effect, and people I believe because they're, they're so far above me that I, you know, it's scary. <laughs> you know, when I think about my life and theirs, how, how different it is and how far up they are in this monetary chain, they're going to collapse the economy absolutely on purpose. So you can't move. That whole thing is, you got to realize they've been setting and getting we'll talk about the underground cities i wanted to talk about some out here in asia but they've been on this since the mid 80s building readying constructing preparing and do you think they're really going to just let all these people move and disrupt what they've set up do you think they're going to let 300 million people move down to indonesia because it's got a warm climate do you really think the local Indonesians will let you move down there with 300 million foreigners with their money into a place where religions clash, nobody knows the other language? And what do you think about all these other equatorial countries? Do you think they're going to welcome a billion other people from Western nations down there that just have the money to move there? How's that going to upset the food grow areas that are already set aside for, oh, this habitation zone's already been set aside. It's already been turned into a natural garden. See, that's what they've done with a lot of these places. They call them, you know, these habitation zones, these UNESCO sites. When they replanted all the trees in there, when they were doing a lot of uh, tailoring of agriculture, shall we call it, they put an enormous amount of fruit and different types of long-term uh, trees inside there. They were providing nuts and and oils and berries and fruit and they set it up as literally an ecological garden now do you think after they spent 40 years terracing these places and getting them the literally hundreds of square kilometers of open garden basically that they're going to let you and billions of people just walk into these places of course not and james if i might add one little point here i'll talk about john in a minute as a matter of fact uh, i'll say right now i sent john a message right here just the other day about thanksgiving because he's the one who really opened to my eyes to what is happening and why and the cycles and what's happening with the grand solar minimum and all these things. And we talked and I've had him on interview and we communicate occasionally here and there. He's doing well after his stroke. He's definitely recovering. Still can't go for full on interviews like he used to, but he is miles ahead of where he was. But when I wrote him this little couple paragraphs here for Thanksgiving, it was to the point where I'm so grateful And I have the newest appreciation for food in front of me. And the bountiful thanks that I gave, it was just something I've never experienced before. Of how thankful I was at the foods in front of me. Because I know what's on our doorstep. I see the future in a few years. And the Thanksgivings that we have right now, you will remember as you're dreaming about food somewhere, you're going to look back on these and go, oh, remember when we had the full plates and all these things? Now, there's still going to be a lot of people in the population that have these full plates at Thanksgiving, but there's going to be a hell of a lot who don't. 
And if you're in that category and you didn't prepare and you didn't heed the warnings and you thought everybody was just full of smoke because you believed it was CO2 warming and you'd been that that indoctrinated that you couldn't even look one fifth of one eighth of a foot over to the to the left to see a possible different explanation to all the changes that you were that brainwashed that you couldn't even consider a second possibility. I'm sorry, man, you're going to be maybe over there in the food line. But uh, oh, and one last thing, James, you were talking about underground cities. Matsu Islands. I don't know if you're familiar with the Matsu Islands. I want my girlfriend. Yeah, they're an island chain that's off of, you have to fly north of Taiwan an hour on an airplane. And then it's just, you can actually see mainland China from these islands. But during the uh, World War II, uh, Taiwan had controlled these islands and they still do. Case in point, they have cities under these islands that A, hold 20,000 people each. And then they're connected by tunnels underneath the water. Because we visited... A very small segment of a portion of this underground uh, facility that was set when they thought the Chinese communists were coming over. This is they built this in the 50s and, and the 60s. And it's an open to the public kind of place where you can walk down this super long ramp. And I mean, super long. When you come up this thing, you are so winded. It's sort of like half mile tunnel down into the earth. And then it breaks out into the, all these open places along the coast where they had machine gun nests, etc. The rest of that is off limits to the public. That rock was so perfect for carving underground cities that apparently every island has its own set of underground cities, all connected, and then it connects back to the Taiwan mainland. And this is just these little islands off of them in Matsu that's here in Taiwan. Can you imagine if they had true continental space, what they could have done? I mean, my gosh, they, they're, they're able to house like over 100,000 people out on these islands underground. And who knows what they have for food growing under those facilities down there. But it's still live today. Absolutely. Troops out there, everything still all underground. Well, that's fascinating. I'd love to be able to see that. That would be uh, that would be something else. One of the challenges that we face, David, and I know that you feel the same, is the education. There's so much noise going on, fake news and so many distractions, you know, not to mention the electronic interference with the cell phones. And now they're coming out with these 5G towers, which is, <laughs> I was reading an article on that, where they have to have one of these towers, I think every 500 feet or so, you're going to have these towers all over, like littered everywhere, these 5G towers. There's so much outside influences and outside interference that the task, David, and, and you're right, this seems to all be di by design. It's very difficult to have people you know, maintain focus on just how dire the situation is. That's the one thing that I can say when I try to tell people about, you know, what's coming up. I'm saying, you know, listen, you have to understand, this isn't like a theory or something that I'm concocting here or, you know, saw in a crystal ball. This is history. This is historical. Just look at history. And when I try to tell people, we're trained to think linearly. January 1st, to December 31st, we're trained to think, and that's just one example, um, but really nature and the world and the universe and the earth, how you want to characterize that, it, uh, that operates on cycles. Um, not It doesn't operate in a linear fashion. It operates in a cyclical fashion. And, you know, that's one of the things that I have to try to break people's mindset of this whole linear thinking and realize that, you know, this, we're just going through Another cycle that's, I think, part of probably a larger cycle, um, which may be even part of a larger cycle. This video is brought to you by our friends at TrueLeafMarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet. 